Um, Dr. Deusman, um had some pressing engagements. His daughter was graduating from college this weekend. So um, he asked me to give his presentation uh, on, on our true little validation. Um, just by way of introducing myself to the committee, um, Associate Director of the Biology Section and Casework uh, at the New York State Police Public Investigation Center. Been there about 10 years. Um, my responsibilities are in casework, um, both in the case management, case review, also I will see validations, uh, automation, and, uh, and training services. So, uh, my background is in genetics and molecular genetics. I, I did postdoc at Cornell for three years uh, in DNA analysis and sequencing. Uh, and I worked for 13 years in private industry, uh, essentially doing recombinant DNA in DNA sequencing and uh, using expression vectors for vaccine candidates. What I'd like to do today is give kind of an overview of our true allele validation. I've been involved with true allele probably since 2001. Uh, we have an uh, association with Mark and Cybernetics. So I've been involved in watching how this program has been evolving and progressing. Uh, and in the last two years, I've taken a more active role uh, in actually the validation, seeing how it's going to work. What I'm going to be talking about today is really from a practitioner's point of view. In other words, how, how can you, the user use this? Uh, and specifically, um, we, at New York State, we've incorporated many of the uh, guidelines from the use of them, uh, guidelines that were, that were published, uh, in particular the use of a stochastic threshold. And uh, we've noticed that we have a number of profiles that come up where we use the stochastic threshold that we seem to leave a lot of information on the table. Uh, we, we can't use the whole profile. Uh, and so, in the validation, I'm going to point out some cases here where we're able to use Trulia. Actually, I think get a much better picture, uh, a much better weight using a likelihood ratio, particularly on examples where we have to do an unrestricted uh, probability of inclusion. Now, early this, this year, I selected two of our analysts uh, one of them who had never had any association at all with Trulio. And staff from Cybergenetics came up and went through a three day intensive training program with them. Uh, and then they have, we were given the, the, the go ahead to use 25 uh, cases, burglary property crime cases, uh, not adjudicated. There were no suspect uh, in, in this study. In addition, I'm going to report on some prior work that was done with primarily sex assault cases that were adjudicated. And that's a topic of a JFS paper, which I think is soon to be published. And also there was a one, one particular case I'm going to go in detail. It was a very complex case. It was an assault that had many, uh, I think about five suspects, one victim, uh, I think about 30 different evidence items, many of which were two and three person mixtures. So hopefully um, this will give you an idea of how how we see we can use um, our tool at this point. So as I mentioned, we were given to go ahead to study with non-adjudicated property crimes. In this case, we selected 25 burglaries. Uh, there was 91 evidence items. So these were all no non-suspects, so we did not have suspect references. However, we did have uh, what we call elimination controls, essentially help the homeowners the way it was used. Now, in, in our reporting of these, we did uh, six match probabilities to essentially single source matches in the cases. Um, Trulio came up with 33 preferred genotypes with likelihood ratios greater than zero. Now, this doesn't mean that we missed all of these. This simply means we didn't report stats on them. So by definition, these 33 LRs must have, the LRs must have been computed using the homeowners, basically. Or you didn't have any other individuals to 
Well, they, they in, I think, truly inferred the genotypes. But as you'll see in the next couple slides, and then we compare them to these references. Right. Yes. Next slide, please. Uh, yeah, as Mark had just mentioned, um, this this is a bar chart. These are the DNA items. Yeah, we said we had 33 of matches per genotype, we should say. Uh, and this is the likelihood ratio, went from 1,000 up to 6 million. And each one of these was done in duplicate. Uh, you see the blue and, and the green. So you see, like, now at the lower likelihood ratios, there's a lot of variability. Because, again, these are not probably that relative, um, that, that significant. As you, as you come up, the increase in your likelihood ratio is becoming more significant. These variations increase. Um, we've generally been using something around a million. It's kind of a, this initial cutoff point. Things above that we can go very, very significant. Um, and as you see, once you get above this, your variability becomes very low. I mean, there's still some some variability, but not to the extent that you see with the lower ones. So again, in this, as Mark pointed out, this represents the mean. Okay, this is a log base 10, 10.72. 10 and this is the reproducibility of the standard deviation. Okay. Next, what we wanted to do was see how sensitive and how specific Julia was. And what we did is set up on these 25 cases. We looked at, there was sort of duplications, I think there was 22, and we, we picked one specific case, which there were 20, 22 inferred genotypes. And then we did a within case sensitivity and a between case specificity which I'll, I will explain. These are the counts, these are the likelihood rate logs of the likelihood ratios. Uh, and in this case, this is all comparing evidence to reference samples. So it's evidence samples, we have deferred evidence profiles compared to, in this case, I think there was three uh, elimination points. So within, within case sensitivity, as you can see, there were some significant likelihood ratio compared to matches to the inferred uh, over the number of duplications uh, and, and reiterations of this is a number of counts. Notice that you know also there was a number that were not significant. And there was some in a kind of a mid-range here, uh, which the cybergenics staff, I guess, inferred that these were due to 50% genotype mixtures and perhaps some family interrelationships within these inferred genotypes. Ross, is the implication that these, uh, these profiles on the left-hand side, these are from the bad guys? Is that the implication? No, 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 no. In fact, uh, these are all the significant ones, but again, this is comparing the inferred genotypes just to those references. Right, but the ones on the left, if you've got a level ratio of minus 10, right, it, it doesn't matter basically, right? So are, right. are, these, the, are these the profiles and possibly from the from the, the assailants, from the from the parent perpetrators. Because it must be a profile you're looking at there. And this guy like the ratio of But these are very low likelihood at this point the improvements have very low likelihood ratios. Okay. So so the good point I I guess it could be, but how significant they are. Now this is very interesting. This is between case. Here we took evidence items from this specific case. And the inferred genotypes, compare them against all the references from the other cases. And as you can see, we didn't get really anything significant. Everything was below zero. So this kind of gave us confidence that it's it is specific. It's not just picking out random profiles and trying to you know shoehorn things in. Very specific. Next slide, please. Now, here we're comparing the same thing with evidence to evidence. It becomes a little bit more blurry. Um, and, Russ, I'm sorry, how many yeah. cases were you looking at? Were you there were 25 cases, 25 cases. But this is one specific case, and we're comparing like the specificity between all the other 25. And the, in the win case, it's just within that specific case. Mm 
<laughs> so here we see we have again 13 uh, evidence genotypes compared to um, again 5 and 13 evidence types. Within the within the evidence evidence, notice that again we you know we see some shared thing in, in within the case sensitivity. This is like evidence, evidence, so it's, it's, it's right that probably within the evidence you would have similar profiles. Again, these are from one household. So again, you would you would think the family members are, are, are gonna be present in a lot of these mixture profiles. Okay. Here now is between case specificity. So again, we're taking the evidence items in this case, comparing it with the inferred profiles from evidence in other cases. And again, nothing of the so from this, I think we were fairly confident that we're showing, again, just using casework, not, not derived of uh, practice cases or anything like that. These are actual casework. They were selected from October to December of last year, completely at random, uh, and showing that you know, we had no prior knowledge whether they were associated or not. Uh, so I think it shows us that it, it, is, it is sensitive enough to pick up but it's also very specific. Next slide, please. Professor, can I just ask one yes. the, 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 the two slides previously where you have high high LR, right? Were these codes eligible profiles? The, the ones that had a high likelihood ratio. Did you did you then upload these to CODIS? Uh, all these particular profiles, the ones that had a high LR. Well they were all elimination, so so they were not CODIS eligible. Okay. They weren't because yeah, they by definition, they, 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 they uh, matched a, a, a homeowner. So these other ones then, I'm trying to, it's these other ones, were these other ones, uh, and they, are they, are they uploaded? No, no, no. We, we did not. No. No. They're, they're parts of complex mixtures. Okay. <coughs> now, this is a slide which I think Aaron has presented before to the subcommittee. Uh, I wanted to uh, show it again because it's a very, uh, very important slide. Um, in this case, these, this is using the 41 cases uh, that the, the adjudicated cases, primarily sexual assaults, that are the, the topic of the JFS paper. Uh, and in that, I think there were 80 some inferred genotype matches. And what you see here, this blue cloud is the likelihood ratio that truly came up with all of these descending. Underneath these, this diagram bar show what we came up with in our analysis, in other words, the human analysis. Uh, notice that in this case, we have four random match probabilities. Uh, these were perfect matches. It's these four. You notice they're identical to the likelihood ratio. So <coughs> there's a direct correlation between the likelihood ratio and the random match probability. I'm not a statistician, but I'm sure Mark can explain you know, that relationship. But in any case, so we had we had nothing. These are essentially identical. Now, the, the green represents likelihood ratios that we're able to do in these cases. Again, you know, they're they're again a, a better stat than what you see in the orange, which are the combined probability inclusions. So these are all the comparison matches that we were able to make in the stats that we're able to present. Obviously, in, in these cases, you guys, Trulio gives a much better response. Here we'll go to low tech. Notice, like in these two, the CPIs that we're able to, to report okay, in relation to what the likelihood ratio that Trulio came up with. Trulio gives a much, you know, a much better statistic. And the reason is because it's able to use much more of the information than we are. And yet, probably, probably in inclusion, we have to eliminate a lot of low side, particularly now, using stochastic thresholds. Anything that has a peak or low stochastic threshold, you can't include that low percentage step. So again, it's really limits us. Actually, here, I would make a comment. I have seen these graphs in 
from various circles. But in comparison of like your dress, your any element of it, you see here is just comparison of apples and oranges. CPI does not use the same data the like you address in the process. And the consequence is that it is orange bar comparison is somewhat misleading. It's true, the CPI is a very inefficient measure. But its comparison with like your ratio is simply in the lab. Again, I'm not a statistician. Yeah. Mark, do you want to respond to that? Uh, we have an interesting poster, uh, uh, and the result isn't new. Uh, when you speak to British statisticians, they uh, they all, I don't think write paper on it, but they know this. Uh, CPI is a likelihood ratio. All match statistics that everybody actually knows about are likelihood ratios. The question is, in the part of the, the inferring of the genotype called the likelihood function, is different than a likelihood ratio. That's the part that engages a hypothesis of what the allele pairs are relative to the data. The likelihood function of the inclusion method, of CPI, is where you have thresholds, you consider all possible pairs, and so on. So it's an apples to apples comparison, they're just different brands of apple. What's happening is that the more use you make of the identical data the crime lab is processed from a crime scene, in your mathematics, uh, the more informative, the better explanatory power. It's the best way of understanding likelihood. Anyway, I do not. I do not want to get, engage into these technical okay. details in the audience. But uh, I, I think it's, um, uh, <coughs> the what the other three statistics that you are computing uses a different kind of data than the concept of CPI. As a consequence, the comparison of CPI with the rest of this is, in my opinion, meaningless. And, and, and according to what I've written and what I've read and published and so on, um, it's very meaningful because it shows that the more use you make of the data you have, whether it's relatively little in the inclusion likelihood of like the function, moving up to using the victim in a CLR sort of statistic, moving up to the full profile at CMP or RMP, where there's no ambiguity so it gets easy, but using more of a quantitative data, what those key points actually are that groups like Massachusetts uses, uh, where they're not using a computer, but they make more use of the same data. The question is, how informative is the likelihood <coughs> I think it's very low. And, and many groups around the world, independently, different continents, different universities, different organizations, are finding that the most informative likelihood of no, I, th I think you are confusing uh, between two things. CPI can be calculated even with use of more informative data that you are using. The concept of CPI is you have to exchange. And, uh, what is the chance that a random person can be included as a part contributor of that mixture? That's the concept of CPI. But the likely, uh, that, uh, that computation does not use any information on genotype of known persons. When you compute a likelihood ratio, you have two contrasting hypotheses, and you are uh, asking the question, <coughs> what is the what's the weight of those hypotheses based on my DNA information. It uses evidence information as well as information on known subject. So as a consequence, comparison of CPI and the likelihood ratio becomes some, some sort of, you know, only apples and oranges, probably uh, comparison of human and mouse. Uh, I, and, I, and if I may, as far as a user or practitioner, we would much rather afford a like yeah. than the CPI. Yeah, I agree. So, I agree. Yeah, so no matter how, how they're related, yeah. um, this, the CPI that we report now, even with using statistic thresholds, I completely street. agree with that statement. What yeah. I'm saying is the CPI by its definition is much less informative than a like regression. 
But I think from the pra practical standpoint as well, I, th I think what's startling about this graph is that the spaces where we don't have uh, uh, histograms, you're getting results. Well, that was yeah. my next point. Oh, sorry, okay. <laughs> that, that's the most startling thing I would yeah. say. Yeah. On, that, on, yeah. That's exactly the point. Yeah, sorry, on your on your That's okay. <laughs> Um, yeah, in many of these, we were not able to say anything. Um, right. But yet, truly, it was able to give likelihood ratios to us. So again, you know, we, we would much rather report a likelihood ratio than a CPI. And also, you know, where we can't see something. And I wouldn't say that we don't, in, in just our visual inspection of it, we don't see some similarities. <coughs> the problem is it becomes more complicated with three, four-person mixtures. You try to sit there and deconvolute it without the aid of some computer program. So intuitively, then these 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 ones with space where there's no CPI, when you look at them, intuitively you can you can sense that, that it's not as if it's a blank line. There's some exactly. there's, there's, there's information there, but you the human mind can't copy it. It's not that easy. In many of those cases, that's right. Yeah. Some of these we we don't always if we're doing a match a likelihood ratio. Some of the other items in it we may not do a stat on, even though we possibly could. So, um, but but the, I guess to me as a again a, a user, is that it seems like we can get much more information out of these profiles, and we can report a likelihood ratio, which which we feel is, is much more significant statistic. So building on what Jack said, uh, so when you look in these areas, these voids, and, and you do that. And, you say, oh yeah, this makes sense. I mean, is that some of the, you look at the uh, profile and you see what true allele is and you, you go back and you, you do that comparison and you say, yeah, this makes sense to me. I can see where these, uh, these combinations have been pulled out of this mixture. And, you know, I couldn't do it personally because it was so convoluted, but I didn't see what <coughs> it um, Is that? You're basically correct, yes. Um, I mean, oftentimes we can see, as I mentioned, we can see some association, but you know, given the complexity of the mixture, mm -hmm. given all the overlaps and stuff, you know, we can't make a definitive statement. But it's truly on our modeling because again, it can include everything. If we have a uh, analytical threshold and now a stochastic threshold. So again, below the analytical, we're not really considering those. But it's truly it can. It models everything. It uses all the information that's there, and especially in the case where. You know, we, we are limited to doing a CPI uh, where we know that oftentimes there's much more information that we would like to use from the electric program, from the actual data that, you know, we're constrained and, and can't use based on our culture. Okay? Any slides? Yeah. Um, so this is kind of an interesting slide. Again, this is the same. Uh, JFS cases to 42 uh, different cases. This represents, you can't probably see the legend very good, but uh, it represents looking at truly the single source matches that it made and the matches it made with using mixtures compared to what we have. So in this case, I think SCP yellow, let's see, SCP yellow represents the United States. So this in this particular case, we were able to, with these profiles, with this this number of single source matches, <coughs> true allele and green gave basically the same amount. And if you look across the different cases, they're roughly the same. It shows that you know, we don't really have any issues picking out single source matches uh, as compared to what true allele is. However, when you get into the mixtures, that's where it becomes significantly different. This particular case is where this is how many we were able to pick out. This is what truly opened for match. And if you if you look, let's see the blue. If you look across, you see that in most in most cases, uh, truly was able to infer more than what we were able to infer just by our own uh, visual inspection and protocols. Now there these ones that are flagged with red, four cases where. We weren't able to say anything from the mixtures, and yet truly it was. Next slide, please. Okay, the last thing I'd like to talk about is a 
a case, again, it was an adjudicated case, it's, it's an assault case. Um, it was very complex. Uh, we had over 30 different evidence items. There were six known references to a victim and five suspects. Uh, this was an, a, a gang assault on this victim at his residence. And I think they, they beat him with a bat, a cross stick, a broom. <coughs> so we had, we had blood evidence. Uh, then when they left, they left a lot of their clothing. So we had clothing items for uh, you know, ownership type profiles. Um, so in the end, we had 36 total items between the references and, uh, and the evidence. And so there were 180 different pairs of comparisons. Now, a lot of these profiles were three and four person mixtures. So again, very, very complicated the way we do things now. We try to decompile these mixtures. Uh, in addition, uh, the DA's office didn't help us much because they didn't give us all the controls at once. So we kept getting in, and we get in two, three, and then we get another one, and they sent some more evidence in, which each time meant we had to go back and we look at everything. So uh, it was then, of course, there's technical reviews involved in that and all the other reviews, and so it, it just became a very, very time consuming. Uh, process. So this again was adjudicated. Um, actually, the analysts had to testify on one with a conviction, <coughs> and then the other guys all pled. But I want to point this out is what we feel is an advantage, again, of using true allele to deconvolute uh, in these complex cases. Next slide. Now, what I show here is basically. Uh, an output of one of the modules in, in Trulia. Trulia has what they call a viewer, which is the interface. And there's different modules. The last module is a report module. And again, this gives, these are the likelihood ratios, the log of the likelihood ratios. Across the top are the reference items. And they were all coded for this study. This represents the victim. And these are all the evidence items. So on the first go through, with these, and I guess cybergenetics ran these, we were able to get a lot of very good likelihood ratio. By the way, this was profiler, profiler, uh, not identifier. Uh, a lot of these represented single source matches or major contributors that we were able to match, primarily like blood evidence from the people. But in addition, we were able to see from one of the suspects being included on this item, very good likelihood ratio. This one, at least above our threshold of, of a million. Likewise, this particular suspect also came up on this item, very good, 10 to the ninth. This one, you know, at least there was some, some association. And all the, the, uh, the first column is the item, right? This is, this is the item. Yeah. Okay, so uh, you have full profile for all of the items or partial profile for some of the items? Um, well, in a lot of the single source, there were full profiles. Uh, in the other ones, there were mixture profiles, mm -hmm. some with major contributors that were. No, what, I'm, uh, what I was trying to find out is the <coughs> comparatively lower likelihood ratios, if they come from incomplete profile for those items are it is uh, complexity. Complexity. For the most part they come with the three and four person mixtures. Okay. Now in this analysis and again in our original analysis, uh, we found um, a Jane Doe and a John Doe, in other words a, a, a unknown female, unknown male profile. So we then ran it again using those in conjunction with so next slide please. So here's our Jane Doe and John Doe. Um, I think if I it's here. Yes, the, the Jane Doe, to me, the, the John Doe profile is defined from a single source. That's this one right here. Uh, and the Jane Doe profile is derived from a a major contributor to the mixture profile. 
But again, they have very good run for these shows. And then in comparison, comparing that to back to the evidence, now we see that the Jane Doe also shows up here, this item, here, and this item. And also this item. This one's rose to mind. And likewise with John Doe, he showed up in two additional items. Now again, we had these in our original analysis too. Um, you know, was it that Julia was able to pick it out and we weren't? A matter of that, showing that once you do have a, a Jane of John Doe unknown profile, it can be used again to compare to the inferred. Next slide, please. Now, this is a feature of Trulia which we really haven't explored that much, but I just thought I would, I would mention it. It's where it can do a joint analysis okay, using two different items. In this case, this item and this item, which were both four person mixtures, jointly in lines. And then compared to the references. And in, in two cases, <laughs> or, excuse me, in one case, this suspect turned up with likelihood ratios 10 to 6, both of these items. So again, we thought that was that was something that again we could see these are four person mixtures, lots of overlap. Uh, two of these suspects were brothers. So again, we have familiar yeah, things. Um, but again, this joint, I don't know how we would utilize this. Again, we haven't really explored it that much, but I just thought for completeness, I mentioned we did, um, we did do that in this particular case. <coughs> Next slide, please. This is the same thing using joint between these two. Um, again, the Jane Doe profile. But again, I'm low. This is the Jane Doe profile. And then being a victim. We think the Jane Doe is a sister of the suspect because the Jane Doe came up on the the boomstick <clears throat> that was in the suspect's house. It looks like this, this. I've been asked to, to show what truly reports as far as genotype. Uh, this would be the genotype report from Trulio giving the different, this is our idea, identifier, giving the, the different allele frequencies. So in this case, for example, if you do 10, 11, with probability of 0.95, so it's a little bit of D21. Okay, there's a, two different possibilities of 30, 31.2, with 0.95 probability, or 30, 30, 0.05. If you look at FGA, there are four possibilities, Again, the first one has the highest probability of the rest for 104 and All right, a question. Uh, is there a threshold for the probability for the two to only one possible genotype? For example, for CSA, 10 11 genotype is predicted with the probability of 95%, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, in some other cases, with, uh, for example, D2, 21 24 is predicted with a 90 percent probability, the alternative is 17 24 is 7 percent probability. Uh, I could ask the same question about CSF. Well, the, the answer is the computer mm -hmm. goes out to four decimal, uh, to four decimal places, mm -hmm. and then the user has control on the interface. Right. Uh, typically, results are recorded at 95 percent, which you can. Mm -hmm. Pick whatever you like, recorded 99%. Uh, all of the allele pairs mm -hmm. that equal or exceed that level mm -hmm. as a confidence set are reported uh, based on all the information in the computer mm -hmm. and it's used for matching within the computer. Mm -hmm. But to generate a written report or something you can print out or see, uh, that is something that the laboratory can determine uh, what their protocol would be on what people should see. So you're correct. So, reporting questions. Uh, and this formatting is compatible with the use of the also, I'm told, the answer to this reporting standard. Russ? Yeah. Have you thought about how you would present this report? So, I mean, traditionally, we have the evidence, 
And then we have the uh, AFLA with reference with a uh, fairly matched uh, prosecutor says, okay, what does that mean statistically? How, how do you envision doing this? A very good question, and we've also pondered that. Uh, at this point, you know, we're, we're looking at that truly not as an expert system, giving us, we're looking at it as a tool to help us decline the rule. So, you know, we use that in conjunction with our other uh, you know, protocols. Uh, and, you know, in, in cases where we're able to say, okay, like for, it's, for example, you know, we know on this position it's a 30, 31, 22 that matches, let's say, one of our reference samples. Okay, that's only one that we want to report. Again, that's based on the policy of the laboratory. We're not going to report everything. I mean, that'll all be in the case jacket, It'll be as reserial material. But it's not something that we would report as an inclusion in the report that we Does that make sense? Uh, yeah, I mean, I've testified about the report. And typically, we show we showed data, genotypes, and match tests. The data is the same sort of data. The genotypes look like probable distributions, either as tables or as pictures, as you saw. And if you want to indicate a match, then you can highlight the allele pair, either on a graph or on a table, indicating where a match might be, as you saw in the picture I showed earlier. And then when you uh, pre present a log of likelihood ratio, that again is presented as a, and you'll see some of these in the Joe's of the picture, but also in numbers. Uh, and, that, and Russ is going to show you one in a second. Uh, so, to indicate a match, it's useful to either visually show the, the common allele pair or to highlight it on a table and indicate that's the suspect. It's actually quite straightforward to present in court in that you're, you can show a match just by highlighting and then on, on a bar graph or on a table. And then indicate <laughs> that's where the match was, this is the extent of probability. What does that mean in terms of mass statistics? Usually on a separate level. Well, we don't we don't see um, these or stochastic threshold <laughs> and this method as being totally independent as far as what we're doing. You know, they complement each other. And they're both allowed by the Sweden guidelines. So I think that you know it's up to the lab how it is going to be utilizing. I don't think anyone's ever been concerned with getting too much information. Yeah. <laughs> so that you, you envision, and perhaps I should wait again, but this being complementary to what you're doing now, and you just not using this totally? Is that what I'm right. We're, we're, not, we're not going to jettison everything that we've been doing. Um, we're going to try to work this in as part, as part, and that's why we're trying to present the validation. We've seen that we feel it adds significant value to our um, mixture deconvolution, and particularly in weights on what we say cannot be excluded, which are the unrestricted CPIs and now that we have to do. Okay. Next slide, please. This is what a match report looks like. Julio, uh, again, is, is looking at the firm based on the African American, Asian, Hispanic, uh, frequency of real tables. And these are the, again, the log of a likelihood ratio of each locus. And there's a product where we just add these up and these are total. Uh, usually with IDF with 15 most high, we're, we're looking in the order of uh, 10 to the 21 to 10 to the 23. Okay, last slide. Just try to sum up everything. Um, <coughs> we feel that one of the main advantages of using Twilio is that it conserves information. Again, one, one of the one of the big issues right now in our laboratory, once we instituted the uh, asymptotic threshold, is that uh, it seems like we leave a lot of the data on the table. Uh, there's a lot more there that we have to use. We end up with likelihood ratio, or excuse me, uh, CPIs of 10, 50, so not very significant. And that usually because we had to leave out perhaps most of the loci because alleles are falling, falling below that stochastic threshold. So uh, 
again, I think for our initial work, that we see it as being a big, a big plus. Um, you know, I've shown that it's reproducible, uh, it's sensitive, it's specific, it's a big thing too. We don't want Trulo just to be inferring profiles that really are meaningless. Um, now it does, it is very important that you set up whether you're solving for one person, a two person, a three person, etc. And that comes from your initial inspection of your, of your information. And you can do it both ways too. Um, I showed how it solves. It's more information out of cases right now that, that we're not able to say anything for various reasons. There will be more profiles then that we can deduce and report on. Uh, if we get uses more of the other items that we have here. Um, I showed how it simplifies a complex case. Again, that's a big advantage. It seems like more and more um, we're doing property crimes, we're going touch evidence, which always comes up with very complex mixtures. Uh, and even though we can, we can ultimately deconvolute them, um, it takes a lot of time. And also, again, the staff that we can put to it is not necessarily um, indicative of all the information. Um, it's easy to use. I mentioned I had two analysts, and one that had no experience whatsoever. Uh, and they went through, uh, I was going to invite one of them down. Both of them, team, one was tied up in court, one of them was moving their house, so they. Uh, yeah, we get more pressing things. Um, but they'll report to me. They found it after, after the first couple of times very, very easy to use. We had two workstations set up you know, in a room. The interface was 16 processors. And generally, what they would do is go in. Uh, I know one told me they, they did like nine cases in an afternoon, uploads it. In the morning, they came in, you know, the computer punches during the night. They came in in the morning, all the information. And we feel that it's easy to report, again, using the likelihood ratio, <coughs> which again, we, we feel uh, what we would rather report than 